Hello, I'm Commissioner Ben Hublin with the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Today, as we continue our 2020 Lessons Learned video series, I'm pleased to be joined by Joe Gloria. Joe is the Registrar of Voters of Clark County, Nevada, a position he's held for eight years, and he's been serving the voters of Clark County since 1995 also serves on the EAC Standards Board. Uh, and so we appreciate uh, all that he does. And uh, thank you, Joe, for joining me today. Uh, to start off, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about Clark County? Most people know it as uh, maybe no Las Vegas. Uh, my friends and relatives there, though, would want me to be sure to give you a chance to tell people uh, a little bit more about Clark County. Sure, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yes, most people know Clark County as the entertainment capital of the world and maybe not quite as common, the marriage capital of the world. So uh, that's where we live and here we serve a uh, little over 1.2 million voters. Clark County is proud to have um, been somebody who really started in the early 90s with the early voting program and progressed it to uh, shopping malls, grocery stores and um, really giving full access to voters during the early voting period. And of course it's hot here. So we're in the hot period. We got a little rain, so it's humid too. So we're suffering a little bit, but it's a great place to live and I'm proud to serve here. That's great. And, and you're absolutely right on that. I was, I was out in Nevada for an election several years ago now uh, and, and saw, you know, saw that, uh, you know, saw a voting center in a, in a grocery store. I think it was the first time I'd ever seen that. And I thought it was, it was really cool. Um, and so, you know, again, as you said, you all have been doing a great job in Clark County serving your voters for a long time and, and really pushing a lot of programs to help to help voters participate. Um, you know, the 2020 election was was certainly like no other I've seen in my career, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and as we are, are all the elections really and as we, uh, you know, work to identify lessons uh, from the election uh, or the elections in 2020. We're talking to election officials like yourself about uh, how they dealt with many of the challenges of 2020. Um, and we've heard a lot about how the pandemic impacted election administration uh, in 2020. And of course, because each state uh, runs elections in its own uh, unique way, each state had a, a little different response to the pandemic. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Nevada is no different there. Actually, you had some of the most uh, significant changes and, and challenges, I'm sure, adapting to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the changes that your jurisdiction made? Uh, I know, again, both uh, you had the June primary uh, <laughs> and the November election. And so uh, if you want to talk about both of those and, and how you adapted uh, to the changes and the challenges that those presented. Sure. And, and leading into the election, we already had a full boat of activity, being that the legislature instituted automatic voter registration at DMV, which commenced in January of 2020. And we also added same day registration to uh, the access that we provide here in Clark County. But obviously, as everybody dealt with in late March, we, we were uh, informed that uh, the pandemic was going to be a very serious issue. And uh, as counties, we all got together and uh, made some decisions that I think were the right decisions to make, but it certainly made for an even bigger challenge for us leading into the election. And we decided to go all mail for uh, all of the election and the primary. And then in uh, mid uh, 2020, in a special session through AB4, the legislature went ahead and pushed that forward and included it for 2020. So we had to get really smart really fast. Uh, fortunately, there was a ton of help from the Secretary of State's office and also federal partners. We got some funding and we immediately began work on implementing the use of a mail ballot processing system, the Agilis, which was a tremendous help. And looking back on it now, I don't think we would have made it had we not made that addition to, uh, to, to what we used to process the mail. So moving from March to May with an all mail was a tremendous challenge. We also had to look at uh, finding a new vendor so that we could uh, make sure that we had a printing vendor who was capable of producing 1.2 million ballots uh, for us to send out and receiving those ballots and processing them was obviously a great challenge for us. And the largest election uh, that we had supported so far in 2018, we had processed a little over 44,000 mail ballots and that grew tremendously, not just in the primary, but certainly in the general, we processed over 450,000. So um, 
I think one of the biggest um, obstacles that we had is there were a lot of assumptions made that a lot of people in elections who don't really know what it takes to put on an election assume that you can flip a switch and everything changes and everything works the way you want it to work. But uh, states like Colorado, Oregon, and Washington had several years to prepare for the type of process that they provide for their voters. And obviously we weren't going to get there, but I'm very proud of what my staff did. And uh, we worked together uh, as a state and all the counties and the secretary of state and uh, working together, we were able to put together a process that upheld the integrity despite the misinformation that was uh, uh, being dispersed throughout the, the country. Uh, we did an excellent job, I think, of upholding the integrity of the process and making sure that we were going to provide access to those voters who were very concerned about the possibility of uh, being exposed to the pandemic in voting. Yeah, and, you know, again, there was Obviously, as we learned more through the pandemic about uh, about COVID nineteen, uh, about what precautions could be taken, you know, it was such an evolving process. And and with your June primary, you know, again, I mean, very impressive to be able to make that shift. And and I can't even imagine the work that went into it. As you said, you know, the the more traditional vote by mail states did that over a process of years, and and to really. Did you say forty-four thousand and eighteen, and you jumped up to? Uh, that's a that's a huge jump to to adapt to. You know, a lot of the work we did was talking to those jurisdictions about that process. But uh, I mean, really, just a tremendous uh, effort to make that jump. Um, and to be clear, so for your June primary, uh, it was it was full mail. You didn't have polling places. Um, but then for the November election, or is that, sorry, is that incorrect? Well, actually in June, we did, we were um, providing an in-person opportunity okay. compared to what we do in a normal election. Uh, in 2018, we had 33 early voting sites for 14 days and 172 vote centers for voters to get out and cast their ballot. But um, we weren't able to secure polling sites in the June primary. Uh, we did everything that's why we worked so hard to do everything we could to get the mail in so for early voting for 14 days we had one early voting site okay and on election day we had three uh gotcha. vote centers which is uh which was a tremendous challenge just to get staffed because we had several people who were very concerned about getting out obviously if you're going to serve voters you know you're going to get thousands of people in the door and you really don't know what their condition is so we, we had to deal with some challenges. We actually had a day where we were diagnosed with a worker who had COVID, um, but uh, we did a lot of preparation and our risk management department had set up a process where we could immediately call the vendor out. So believe it or not, uh, we received notification by about 10.30 a.m. and uh, we cleared the area. We informed everybody exactly what needed to be done. We identified the person who were in close proximity to that person. They didn't come to work the next day, but we opened the next day and the vendor had sanitized the entire area. But had we had the normal early voting process, we don't just, I don't even want to think about what might have happened with uh, several sites open, but we couldn't get the site. So we did the best we could. Yeah. Well, and, and that was absolutely, again, uh, the way it evolved. And thanks for, for correcting me on the, the limited uh, in person options. You know, it, it really was uh, this evolving thing where you had. Uh, you know, you had some states uh, and jurisdictions who are some states that had their primary, you know, in that that Super Tuesday right before sort of everything changed in March. Uh, you know, you had folks who, uh, you know, postponed their primaries. You had folks who were sort of in that uh, in that no man's land. Uh, and then obviously, as everything evolved, uh, you know, exactly what you're saying is what we saw in, in so much of the country with with traditional poll workers dropping out. Uh, with with places not being available, uh, but then in in November you still mailed ballots to everybody, but had more of a a, a hybrid model, if you will, or uh, more vote centers open by November. Is that correct? Or that, that is correct for the, for the general uh, with uh, with the enforcement of AB four, which as I mentioned, the special session came in in July, and the legislature. Um, instructed us what we were going to do and we continued with the mail ballot but we also provided the in-person which meant that we had to develop processes and procedures for how we were going to create a safe environment for people to come in for early voting on election day but during the early voting period we believe it or not supported 35 sites 
uh, for 14 days uh, during the early voting period. And then on election day, we had 125 vote centers that, and both of those uh, early voting and election day sites served also as mail ballot drop-off locations, which again was another challenge that we, uh, we weren't accustomed to dealing with, uh, with the small number of mail ballots that we had in, in past history, we, we may have had, um, uh, we, we would get out in the rural areas and end up with about 12 or 13 drop-off sites on election day. And during uh, the early voting period, maybe four or five, we relied on the U.S. Postal Service for that. So, so again, supporting and manning uh, the staff that needed to get out and get those uh, mail ballot drop-offs securely delivered back to the warehouse, that, that was another tremendous logistical challenge for us. I'll, I want to circle back to, to the, the, the process of, you know, adapting around uh, mail ballots and uh, in a second, but uh, I guess, you know, getting back to the idea of, of how you adapted for in-person voting, uh, you know, obviously, as, as I mentioned before, or as we were talking about before, uh, you know, recruiting poll workers, always a challenge, but, but particularly uh, so many traditional poll workers being uh, in some of those higher risk categories. Uh, we saw a lot of folks staying home in 20 all over the country. Uh, and you mentioned uh, securing locations. Uh, you know, we heard about that as an issue too. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, you said for the June primary, very limited numbers, uh, more so in November. Uh, were there things that you were able to do to, to secure or replace locations um, and or, or find uh, you know, more poll workers or enough folks to, to serve in the in the early voting locations and the vote centers? Yes, Commissioner, that, that's a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up because we also had to pull a rabbit out of a hat on that one. Um, we had already developed an early voting schedule for our 14 days in the general, but obviously that wasn't going to work because uh, we normally serve voters in malls, grocery stores, uh, a lot of public places where um, the facilities just weren't comfortable uh, agreeing to allow us to bring several thousand voters through the facility based on their concern for the pandemic. So uh, we worked with our uh, county and municipal governments to secure uh, government facilities. Uh, so through primarily in community centers, um, we've got a program here in Clark County for early voting where we actually make use of convention tents for voting and we expanded that nearly doubling the number of tents. So of those 34, 35, I should say, sites, uh, 16 of them were permanent uh, tents um, that you would see if you went to a wedding at a golf course or something like that. They're very nice looking tents and we kept, we were able to keep them heated and cooled depending on, on, on the weather, which is uh, shifts quite a bit in October here in Nevada. You might get one hot day and then all of a sudden it starts to get cold. So uh, by doing that, all we needed was a flat surface for us to provide ADA access and then to secure the connectivity. We do several tests and surveys to get out there, but the rest of the sites were community centers, which normally are, are a little bit um, hesitant to give us 14 days of activity because obviously in those rooms, that's how they generate revenue by uh, leasing those rooms to uh, groups within the community who come in and make use of it. But by doing that, we were able to provide a 14 day solid uh, for 35 sites. So we didn't move around like we normally do, which the, our voters really like when they just take a look at the sample ballot and find the grocery store nearest to them. So they can go and vote when they go grab a, a gallon of milk. And uh, they've become very accustomed to that. And then on election day, all virtually all of our early voting sites, it didn't make sense to uh, cancel those because people were already voting for 14 days there and they were aware of where it was. So they told their friends and neighbors. So we kept all of those. And then uh, we really relied on the public school system to, since they were out of school. So that wasn't as big an issue for us to get in there and set up for our uh, election day. And uh, we had to make sure that we weren't uh, disenfranchising those in the rural areas here. So we have 13 locations outside of the urban area where we have to get out and serve our rural voters as well. So yeah, that's what we did to, to make that happen. And I, I think we did an excellent job of finding a way to make sure that we could still provide that type of access to the voters. It's great. Uh, you know, you mentioned that that Nevada is is traditionally a, an early voting state. Uh, that your voters like that and have grown accustomed to it. Um, and so, uh, you know, as that has progressed over the years, you know, I'm sure your your election day itself, uh, so to speak, has evolved. Uh, and can you talk about? You mentioned also that there were legislative changes that you were implementing this year. 
uh, for the first time. And were there, did you have election day issues, um, you know, or how was election day different this year as far as, uh, you know, with those changes in, in process, both the legislative changes and the adaption, uh, adoption or adapting the pandemic, you know, did you see uh, issues with, with the same day registration you mentioned or provisional ballots or any technical issues? Well, because we were implementing same day registration, uh, that was brand new to us too. And um, we had to find a way because unfortunately Nevada is a bottom up state. We're working hard with the Secretary of State to finally get switched over to a top down model, which will tremendously help everything that we're doing. But since we were in that condition, we had to rely on the Secretary to get reports from all 17 counties to verify that voters hadn't voted twice within the state. Uh, so that created a challenge for us which created a tremendous number of provisional ballots. So when they updated through SDR, we just automatically gave them a provisional ballot because there was no way for us to go ahead and uh, mark that as uh, a good ballot, not knowing whether they had gone next door in Nye County or up north in Washoe. Uh, you've got uh, Douglas and several counties around there or around that rural or urban area where they could have gone and done something they shouldn't have done. So th that created a challenge for us that we had to deal with. And then the canvas period was uh, just a period I don't want to have to live through again, to be quite honest with you, because we had to adjust to um, um, waiting for the mail to come in because they gave voters seven days after election day to uh, for us to receive their ballot as long as it was postmarked by election day. And then the cure process, which was also relatively new to us, uh, that voters had nine days after the election to cure their ballot in case uh, their signature did not match so they had to verify some personal information so that we would go ahead and move that ballot forward to be counted so so those were some tremendous challenges the the same day registration avr would have been great except the dmv was closed <laughs> so um we're already starting to see great numbers there and that's an excellent way for voters to have a trusted transaction with a government entity for us to get accurate information on updates to their registration or brand new registration because i'm sure you know we get quite an influx of people here in, in Las Vegas moving in and out. So it's a very transient county, which makes it all the more challenging to, to support that kind of access for voters because there's a lot of change. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, I think one of the things I remember seeing one of your press conferences and, and something, you know, that I that really stuck out to me and uh, and I tried to use it a lot in, in the aftermath of the election was uh, you know, you were talking about the provisional ballots and talking about working with the Secretary of State's office and and coordinating with your other counties. And uh, you know, to me, uh, that was uh, you know highlighting uh, that some of the time involved is the safety measures and safeguards that are in place. You know, as as you said, you were confirming uh, that these folks hadn't voted in a different county, that they were eligible uh, to vote in in Clark County. And you know, I think I think that that is something that you know, either, uh, I don't know, if got lost is the right word. It's just, you know, some of the nuances of election administration that I think most average citizens, uh, you know, <laughs> who don't go down into the weeds that election administrators do uh, understand about that process. And so uh, you know, I think it's important to talk about that and how that is a safeguard to make sure, uh, you know, that each person, each eligible American gets to vote, uh, but that they get to vote once uh, and that those safeguards are in place. So. Uh, you know, that's a very good point to make, and, and it's, it's almost ironic that those were, the, that were criticizing us for saying there was no integrity in what we were doing. That's exactly what was slowing us down, was that we did um, commit to making sure that we're, we, and I said it on more than one occasion, I got a lot of heat from it from my elected officials, but we, we weren't in a hurry to process ballots. Uh, we were trying to make sure that we were doing everything correctly. Mail was brand new to us. And so we had to make sure and double check that everything that we were doing was uh, coming out correctly. And so um, there was a lot of pressure from the national uh, level on both parties of why are these guys taking so long? They're working 24 hours a day. Well, we weren't able to gear up to, to, to be able to do that. And then we were dealing with a pandemic as well. So um, we were doing everything we could and moving as fast, but trying to be as accurate as we could as we went through. And I think uh, I think we did a good job in doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like I've, I've heard it at more than one conference. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the fast, accurate or cheap, you can pick two uh, 
not all three, uh, you know, and, and that was certainly it. And, and I think, you know, again, to your point, uh, the most important part here was for it to be accurate. And as you said, uh, you know, so many new processes, you mentioned uh, the mail piece to, so to circle back to that and you hit on some of it, but, but again, I mean, just a massive increase in volume, both for the primary and general, uh, you said, you know, the cure process, the, the timelines uh, for receiving uh, ballots. Can you talk, uh, I mean, we've hit on it some, but, uh, you know, I don't know if you can hit more on, on, on how, again, some of those processes changed or how you adapted to that in a way you hadn't done in previous election years. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the challenge that we were dealing with is that we just didn't have the square footage to do what we were trying to do. Uh, when we went from the June uh, to the primary, there was a huge shift there in what we were going to have to do for in-person voting opportunity. And what a lot of people don't understand uh, that don't uh, deal with elections regularly is that we were we were doing two duties. Uh, normally in the mail, uh, if you look at Colorado, with the, all the mail ballots that they send out, well, their in-person activity has been scaled way back because they don't need it. They're getting 65% 60 to 65 percent turnout from the mail so they don't need 125 vote centers like we did uh they don't need the 35 30 voting sites so we had to find room <laughs> we <laughs> to create a workspace for a, a new set of employees that were going to come in and and work the cure line so that was a group of 15 or 20 people that were constantly on the lines because the, the ground effort here by uh some of the parties is very aggressive and they have a lot of resources. And so they were taking the information that we provided daily on people who were in the cure uh, uh, process. And they would literally, if they had an email or a phone number, call those people and say, hey, we've, we've noticed on the report here. And a lot of those people hadn't received our notice yet. Um, so they, if, if they weren't able to get to them on the phone or an email, they were actually knocking on their door which was a good thing and a bad thing. A lot of people were notified that may not have uh, responded. And we had a very easy process, thanks to the Secretary of State, uh, buying onto a mobile process for curing the ballot where they were able to sign on their phone and take a picture of their ID and send that to us. So that was a good process, but some people really liked the fact that people were trying to help them. And then other people were very upset. Why are you, how, how did you get this information and why is this public and why are you at my door? So, um, just creating the workspace, finding additional staff during the pandemic. Uh, we had to go to two or three, I think it was even four uh, uh, agency temporary uh, groups, uh, private sector folks who were providing us workers because nobody was applying through the county. So we didn't have that well of uh, people that we could just grab an interview quick and bring them in for frontline work on what we needed done. So finding space, literally the square footage uh, getting those people trained up. And then some of them would come in and they'd see the long hours and they were like, this is too much, sir. Uh, I know you said we were going to work some overtime, but I didn't know it was going to be as stressful as it is working here. And then we had the protesters. That did not help either when they drove up to work and there were people outside uh, carrying weapons in front of our facility, which was a completely different challenge that we dealt with in security. Um, now, fortunately, I was made famous by barbecue beer and freedom. Uh, so once that guy came on, uh, it got really serious here. We had officers on the roof and we had, uh, had to move all of our press conferences inside. So yeah, that's just, I could talk all day about the challenges we dealt with. I'm very proud of our staff. I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to collaborate with so many people. The grant money that came in from CTCL, there was a ton of people out there who were trying to help us and it was almost overwhelming because we couldn't let everybody help. But yeah, it was <laughs> like, like I said, you know, this was an election like no other. And, uh, you know, again, it's just it's where the gray hair came from, <laughs> uh, you know, just credit to you and your staff for all the work. Uh, I mean, really amazing. Um, when you look at, at all those changes, um, do you see, um, do you see things, uh, I guess that you'd make a distinction between things that were probably temporary, uh, for 2020 or, uh, you know, things that will will continue to last for elections in Clark County. Um, again, some of some of your changes were legislative changes. So those are here uh, for the foreseeable future, of course. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, as far as some of the pieces that were adapted, 
uh, you know, do you see uh, some of those as being temporary? Uh, maybe the tents, for example, uh, do you think that's a one-off or, or do you think you'll explore using those again in future years and, and other things like that? Well, as far as the tents, we were already using them. Okay. Because um, what we deal with here in Clark County is tremendous growth as far as population. And so a lot of times we get a tremendous number of residential construction going on in an area and there's no grocery store, no school, no community center. That comes years later after the tax revenue comes in. So those tents, thanks to the weather that we have here in Clark County, I don't think you could do it in Chicago or somewhere where they have severe winter. Um, we're able to do that kind of thing. So as I mentioned earlier, just the hard surface is what we need to get in and set that up and permission from the property owner. But I'm really hoping that the pandemic was a temporary thing and we don't have to deal with something uh, like that again that was a challenge that we don't want to deal with that hopefully that's a once in a career uh, type of thing that we have to deal with but there are some things that came in through the pandemic that we'll probably continue to do it's not a bad idea to have sanitizer out there it's not a bad idea to take a look at not packing so many machines in if you don't have to to get people so close together um, but the things that uh, will definitely stay is we have to get much better at um, preparing for the observers that come in. And um, before 2020, the observers that came in were usually very friendly folks who were very interested in learning, who were volunteering for their party to come in and say, hey, how do you do this? And my neighbor thinks you do this or that. And how do you actually make sure that all of this is, uh, that there's integrity in what you're doing? Um, but that wasn't the case last year. Uh, we had people who were in, who were really serving as moles uh, to come in and try to find any chink in our armor that they could take and communicate out to other people to say, hey, this is why we're concerned. They're not doing things correctly. Uh, it's not as clean an effort as uh, they're trying to portray. And uh, we need to attack them for this and, and uh, come after them because they're not upholding the integrity. So um, in 2020, we didn't know that was coming. So shame on them. But in 2022, we know that that's coming. So shame on us if we're not prepared to handle that. And we're going through a tremendous effort right now to develop processes to make sure um, that county is identifying additional space for us. We're going to have to go to another facility because again, as I said, uh, until we can guarantee that we're getting a, a 55 to 65% male turnout, we still have to produce the in-person process for our voters because they're used to that. And so we don't want, um, we don't want that to be our downfall. So in 2022, we'll again provide a tremendous in-person uh, opportunity for voters as well as sending mail ballots out to everybody thanks to the legislative action that occurred this year so um we're, we're working hard there's a lot of people out there a lot of groups uh, like democracy fund devoted home and groups who are very willing to help us and we're looking to get smart and go out to some jurisdictions that do it and do it well so that we can uh take steal anything we can to do it better down here we're not proud in that in that respect we we want to do a good job and so we're going to work hard this fall to learn and uh, make it better. Yeah, and that's that's great. And I have no doubt that you will. But I mean, you hit on one thing there. But again, looking at, uh, I guess, you know, sort of in the lessons learned vein of, of areas, you know, that you see uh, improvement on, obviously, uh, handling observers, uh, you know, is a challenge, uh, you know, that you had more than your fair share of. Uh, you know, I think I've heard interesting things about, uh, you know, people, uh, and some of this would probably have to be legislative, but, you know, people have talked about, uh, you know, do we need to have training there so people understand what they're seeing and understand enough of the process, you know, or, or, or at least education there, but, but more broadly, I guess, thinking about, you know, the things that, uh, you know, you saw through the process uh, that you want to continue to build off of or improve. Uh, you know, to serve your voters. Uh, do you see things, uh, you know, as you go toward 2022 that you'll be doing more of uh, working on specifically? The, the training thing is a big part that we're already talking about proactively. So regardless of legislative action, we're going to require anybody that comes into the facility for observation to go through a quick training period. Uh, we're going to verify every time they come in that they have participated in the training. Um, we're going to do everything we can to in every section of the mail ballot process, which as you know, but I can talk here for 30 minutes about step one to the last step of counting the ballot, but we're gonna put signs up everywhere that clearly identify exactly what's happened in the rooms from uh, the room where we take the uh, 
mail ballot drop off boxes and uh, sort those ballots and get them ready to run through the Agilis. What's happening in the Agilis? When is the automatic signature recognition occurring? Um, what we do to audit that, which now we're statutorily required to do an audit every day of a certain number, I believe it's 1% of the ballots that are run through those machines. And then we move to the manual signature uh, process. So we're gonna clearly define uh, and um, uh, put up signage and provide documentation to all of these people, maybe a basic manual that they'll be able to refer to because a lot of the time that we took in with the observers is that we, we weren't prepared for the number we got. And so we didn't have personnel to handle those people, especially those who were, who were um, making a real scene in, in our rooms and uh, questioning and getting over the shoulders of our workers where they weren't supposed to and questioning things that they weren't allowed to do according to the law. Um, so we'll be better prepared and we're gonna provide that training. I think that's gonna be a big piece of what we'll do to provide more transparency, number one, and hopefully swing these voters back over to uh, what's your new argument because we're showing everything to you and here's the documentation explaining to you exactly what we'll do. So we hope to put that on the website, make everybody aware, communicate with the party so that everybody knows and they won't think it was a surprise. So that, that's a, that's going to be a big project and that's that's on our list of things to do. Yeah, that that sounds great and I, I look forward to seeing it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, as you said, <laughs> we could we could talk about this stuff all day. There's really just so much. But, um, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I want to give you a chance to hit on any other lessons learned or thoughts you have on on how to improve elections out of out of what we learned from 2020 uh, that we haven't hit on yet. Well, for me on my soapbox, well, I wish these states, especially the big ones like California and New York, would jump on the Eric bandwagon. Uh, there needs to be some assistance from the federal government, I think, because now it seems like their only excuse is, well, this is going to cost us. Well, but the cost is small compared to what we need to do to shore up um, what the, the, the perception in the general public is for elections. We all know that there are millions of people out there who don't trust what we did last year, and we need to make sure and do everything we can to convince them. Eric is a no-brainer. Uh, once we get uh, all 50 states on that and we're running that computer and we generate reports that for those states and counties that have the ability to do it, that just becomes part of our everyday routine. And so once a month, we're beginning of the month, we run those reports nationally and we get them. Uh, there'll be smaller reports once everybody's uh, using Eric and, and uh, you know, the first time a state comes on, there's that tremendous influx because uh, there's so many years of records that we have to run through, but uh, that's something that needs to happen. And I, I'd, I'd be very excited to see that happen before my time ends. Well, and that's a, a great point. Uh, the Electronic Registration Information Center for people that, that aren't familiar, but, but you know, thinking about Clark County, you've got uh, a very mobile population. You've got a growing population, as you said. Uh, you know, and so uh, have you seen, um, you know, has, I assume that, that participation has really helped your list maintenance efforts, keeping your lists clean. Obviously, as you move to a, a mail-driven process that has the potential to save you a lot of money as well. Uh, since, since Ron, I don't know if you want to hit on that a little bit more and about how uh, that mattered for 20 or how it'll matter going forward for your voters. Being a member of ERIC has put us in a good position um, to help keep our roles cleaner. They, they, now that they're providing the NCOA as well, the National Change of Address Reports and the death reports, all those kinds of things. Um, it's made a big difference in what we're able to do here because you, you hit on a good point and I think I mentioned it earlier. Clark County is a very transient county, and that's the enemy of a mail ballot, uh, uh, really, in my mind, because we, you, if you don't have accurate information and people are busy in their lives, that's why we try to make it so easy for them to go online uh, to ch uh, change and update their registration. And then we send those ballots out, and you've got these people that say, hey, what's going on? I'm getting ballots for it. They had just moved into this apartment. This person doesn't live here or in the home that they recently bought. Uh, so... Uh, it's a huge tool. It, it really is. And uh, we need to do everything we can to convince those states that aren't members uh, what the benefits are. And if cost is the issue, then uh, the federal government, I, I, I get calls all the time about what we can do to make it better. I said, you, you need to get serious about funding elections. Uh, because oftentimes I'm very fortunate in Clark County that um, the leadership here has taken a very uh, a serious uh, look at, at what it takes for us to support. And we usually get the type of support we need, but 
that's not the case in all jurisdictions. So uh, pay needs to be fair for these people that are putting up with everything that they do. We have to be cybersecurity experts. We have to be mail experts. We have to all, all kinds of things that uh, makes the job a real challenge and not just for the, the person running the show, but the people who actually work where the rubber meets the road. Um, so resourcing elections needs to, needs to be a priority at, in every state. And uh, we should be working to provide more access and uh, more data check so that we can make people feel comfortable with what we're doing. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, certainly I think that's an important uh, note to end on, uh, to recognize the importance of funding elections adequately. Uh, you know, the difference that that makes certainly, as you mentioned, uh, the CTCL grants this year we saw went to to help uh, a lot of jurisdictions around the country. The CARES Act money that the AC distributed, uh, you know, made a big difference. We've seen the impact of the security money uh, on helping replace outdated and paperless equipment, uh, implement, uh, you know, new statewide voter registration databases around the country, uh, you know, harden systems, help assist with audits, et cetera, et cetera. But that all costs money and takes investment. And so, uh, you know, we hope to see more of that. Uh, we appreciate all the work again that you do uh, to serve the, the voters of Clark County. Uh, and so just a, a big thank you to Joe Gloria uh, for joining me today. Uh, we look forward to continuing to have conversations like this uh, as we work to make our democracy stronger and help Americans vote. Thank you. <laughs>